Okay, everybody, welcome. Today we have a Wills Gardner K4900, and this is one of the monitors that my buddy had just dropped off from Kansas City a couple of days ago. Uh, I talked about how he dropped off seven monitors. I think this is number four uh, in the list. I skipped over number three. It was a K7000 that just needed some uh, normal repairs and stuff that I've got videos, countless videos on already. Nothing of note to have pointed out or talked about, so I kind of skipped over three. This is number four out of seven, and this is a 4900 that has never been removed from the frame. <laughs> In all these years, no one's ever touched it, no one's ever messed with it, no one's ever removed it. The neck board has never been taken off. The original epoxy is still there, uh, or whatever it is, uh, adhesive on the neck, so no one has ever taken this off the tube. I'm the first person to ever work on this, which is awesome for me, because that means that no one has ever messed with it or dinked around with it before. Original caps, everything is all the same uh, as it was right off the floor. And it even came with this little piece of paper stuck in here. And it's basically a, uh, another representation of this decal here. As we can see, it might be difficult to open this up and I want to put it back where it was. Um, yeah, must, just the same decal as here, but a little bit more information on what this does and troubleshooting and picture cleaning and things like that. But, you know, it's been sitting here tucked underneath this degauss coil for years and years. So I'll just put it right back where it was. Uh, okay, so it does operate, but I, I, it absolutely needs caps and a reflow because here is what it's doing. One, two, three. Okay, it turns right on. And here is what's going on with it. We've got some oscillation issues. It's rather stable up top, and then the further down you get, it gets worse and worse. Of course, this is vertical, so it's it was in this, the game it came out of was a vertical game, and it's got some screen burning. I don't even know if you can see it. Yeah, there you go, player one, and there's the score, things like that. So not too bad burn, but you can see that it's got some oscillation problems, and I guarantee you it's probably bad caps. And, and cracked solder joints and all the normal stuff that's, that plagues the 4900. So let's uh, acknowledge that. And yeah, wow, crazy. I would just take this and turn it this way, uh, but uh, I don't want to uh, look all g gauzed up on us. So you can get the idea here with it mounted uh, vertically. But yeah, so there's what it's doing beforehand. So let's get this off the tube and give it a review and see if we can find anything that's visually wrong. Uh, if not, we'll do a recap and a reflow and turn it back on and see if that resolved it. Uh, it does need a little bit of cleaning. I'll take, uh, it doesn't need to be washed, but I'll just take my uh, brush here and brush all the dirt and stuff like this off. So we'll get that done too. And somebody mentioned in the previous video that they'd like to see a a time lapse of the cap kit installation and the reflow, so I think that's what we'll do. So we'll get this off the tube and go over it visually, talk about it, and when it comes time to do the cap kit and the reflow, we'll do a time lapse. We'll get it back on and see how it looks. Okay, so here it is off of the tube and the frame. And off camera, I just gave it a little bit of a brush and a dusting. You know, it, it's not dirty enough to, it, to where it really needs to be thrown in the sink and rinsed and cleaned and simple greens and all that. It's just some surface dirt. Uh, remarkably, it's in f relatively good condition. Just a little, just a little dusty and dirty, so nothing really uh, of note on the top. Just a bit dirty. So I gave it a little bit of a preliminary dusting off camera. I may clean a little bit more later, uh, but it is operational and working. So there's not really much on the top to go over. We know all the components are there and everything is in good shape because it's operating and running. Flyback is good. We had good screen position and everything. So, you know, the uh, width coil is okay. But all the caps are absolutely 100% original. And I was absolutely also the first person to ever take this off the tube because I had a tough time trying to get this, this uh, I don't know what you call it. It's not, it's not a epoxy. It's like a caulking material, uh, loose to be able to get the neck board off the neck. So. Yeah, absolutely, surely the first person to ever take it off. So let's turn it around and go over some key points to look at and be on, on the lookout for when it comes to bad solder joints and problem areas on the 4900. So what we, what we want to look at especially 
is the vertical output circuit over here and also this jumper. There are three jumpers from the B plus side out to the rest of the chassis. Now if we look here, let's zoom in, there is a white line that indicates the high voltage, well not high voltage, this is the high voltage side for the horizontal, but the power supply side is what I should say. The white line here represents the power supply side, and the only output from the power supply side to the high voltage side is this little jumper right here. So there's actually three of them. There's a little jumper right here, a jumper right here, and a jumper right here. And the most common plagued problem on the 4900 is this little jumper right here, because this jumper sits in a plastic holder peg. When you set this in the frame, there's a little plastic holder support holder here and it supports the the chassis when it's in the frame and it causes this solder joint to go bad over time so if we look right here we can see that it's actually kind of getting bad already it's not cracked or broken but if you have a 4900 that's dead chances are if it's not a cracked board chances are that this solder joint is cracked or this one but likely it's this one so that's a good inspection point to look at. But we know it's operating and working, so we don't need to worry about that now. If you want to, if you want to do your light bulb test, let's say you've got a dead uh, 4900 here, but this, this uh, contact is fine, or this solder joint is fully intact with no signs of issues. What you can do is desolder it, and you lift this jumper out of the circuit and fold it up. So now you've just killed the output to the rest of the chassis. You can remove this jumper leg, fold it up, attach a clip lead to it, and hook up your meter and hook up a light bulb and turn the system on and your light bulb should light up. And that's how you do the light bulb. You know what? Let's just do that. Just so you can see. Oh, this is dirty. Wow. Let's just go ahead and show that in action just so we can have a reference. So you have a completely dead 4900 and that solder joint is intact and there's nothing visually wrong and you did a good inspection and it's still dead. So you want to test your power supply section. Okay, well, the easiest way to do that is to simply desolder this problem pad. Then we can lift it up out of the circuit like uh, let's use this just to get under here there we go just like that now we've got that lifted up uh, focus there lifted up out of the circuit there you go just like so then we can grab our light bulb and our jumper we're just going to use this black one here and we'll clip on to this and we can give it some power this will allow you to test it without needing to have it hooked up to the picture tube so let's plug in our power here there we go Okay, now let's back out. Now, when we turn this on, we should be able to touch this to the frame and touch this to our bulb and it should light up. And that's how you test your power supply circuit on the 4900. Now, you can grab your meter and see if you're getting B plus, but if this lights up, it's working. So you don't have to worry about that. You're not really concerned with what the voltage reads because the voltage is gonna be different. Uh, unregulated, I think it's 170 something, but it's gonna be different depending on what you use to load down the circuit. This is only a 10 watt light bulb, so it's gonna jump probably like 150 something. So, and you can't, there's no B plus adjustment on the 4900, it's like a 7000. There's a voltage regulator and it regulates the voltage to the proper setting under load. So you, there's nothing to adjust or change. So we're just interested to see if this lights up by touching to the frame in this. If it does, then you have a, a functional power supply, which we already know it works, but this will be educational for testing here. So, uh, yeah, all right, let's go ahead and turn this on. One, two, three. Let's make sure we're not touching anything. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, nothing happens, but it's operational. So we touch this to here, and we should get a light bulb to light up as soon as I touch. Whoa! Make sure you don't t touch the voltage regulator. <laughs> 
I got a little zap for, with my middle finger. They're touching the voltage regulator. Pay attention to what you're doing. Disclaimer, pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, I don't, <laughs> don't hold me responsible if you do something you shouldn't do. Uh, that's why I do this because that way you don't have to. All right, uh, make mistakes that is. So let's make sure we don't put our fingers on the voltage regulator, touch that to the frame and this should light up. There you go, magic. So we have a functional uh, power supply section, which we already knew, so let's turn this off. Oh, now, to discharge this, you can just take your light bulb and go like this, and it should dim down, and then bleed off the residual like that, and there you go. Now it's safe to handle, and you can uh, put this back in. Don't forget to do that. Let's disconnect our power. Don't need that. Don't need that no mo. Don't need that no mo. And let's solder our jumper back in. We gotta reflow it anyway, so there we go. Let's hit the other side. All right, now let's proceed on. Uh, okay, the other problem area is the vertical output. And it's actually, in, this must be, you know, if, even though it had some pretty gnarly screen burn at the top, well, the side actually, uh, it's actually in pretty decent shape. Almost all of these have issues with, with the solder joints in this area. Uh, this resistor right here, right there, these joints, these joints like to get very, R313 especially and R363, these joints like to get very cracked and brittle and broken and thin solder and everything, but this is actually fairly good. So that's one area you want to inspect is right around here. Every time you ever work on one of these, always check this area right there. And then also this resistor here, this one down in here, that one, you want to check these two joints for R503. Uh, every time you ever work on one of these, same thing. Now, but looking at this, uh, even though this is a high hour 4900, I really don't see anything that's bad. All the all the header video header pin solder joints are good. Flyback joints are good. Uh, like I said, R503, uh, R313, 363. This jumper was fairly decent. It did have a little bit of, of uh, wear there, but not too bad. Uh, this jumper here is good. Yeah, I mean the uh, horizontal width coil is okay. Yoke header pins are okay. Uh, our uh, vertical output transistors are okay. Wow, okay, all right. Well, looks like this is in fairly good shape. It just needs a good uh, cap kit and a reflow, and I'll bet you it'll be just fine. So, let's grab our cap kit. I've got my box O kits here. Let's go through and see uh, geo7 centering kit that belongs with the geo7 stuff and we got uh, atari ar2 power supply kits uh, filter caps geo7 with coil uh, other caps supplies i can't fit in my stash of uh, bins power supply caps okay 4900 right there in front and i got one more all right so Set that aside. Okay, well, I guess uh, let's clean up all this dirt and grime here. I need to reattach this somehow. That fell off. Let's get going on the time lapse. You can witness and watch and follow along with the uh, with the cap kit and the reflow. And I always suggest uh, this connector here likes to get crispy on the neck board, so I always suggest taking this off of here and kind of cleaning up the, yep, speak of the devil, just disconnecting it, the black plastic, or the uh, white plastic here, the back, that cracked and broke. So yeah, this likes to get very crusty because it gets very hot. So I always suggest taking this off of here and cleaning up the pins if they need it, and then reflowing the solder joints because they get very dark and uh, thin and, and somewhat cracked as well. So I always recommend doing those. So you'll see me do that as, also. Um, so let's get this, the pins actually The pins actually looked pretty good. So I'll just put that back on and we'll just reflow the solder joints as needed. So 
Um, we'll change out the filter cap if it needs changed out. I don't like changing stuff out just for the sake of changing stuff out. So if the filter cap is good and we don't have a, a wavy image after the cap main cap kit and reflow, then we'll call it okay and I won't change that out. So, um, all right, well, let's get to it.
And there you have it. Full cap kit, full reflow, everything is good to go. So when it comes to the reflow, there's not really a rhyme or reason of what to reflow except for the normal problem areas. And anything else to reflow is just basically to take a good look, a good inspection, and anything that looks like it might need reflowed, just reflow it. That's about all you really need to do. Uh, so that's, you know, the long and short of the reflow procedure. But as far as the caps, what I like to do is people will use the desoldering braid and try and suck the solder up while the cap is still installed and they'll use a, a iron that has too low of heat and they'll lift the pads and damage the pads. I find it's really a lot easier to just heat the pads with the iron back and forth, back and forth, and then you just pull the, the cap out. Uh, then you can use your braid to just kind of lightly tap on the on the pad until the solder is gone. You don't want to hold, you don't want to take your uh, braid here and hold it on the pad and hold the heat on there. I like to just kind of like dab it, dab it, dab it, dab it. That way it doesn't hold the heat on the pad very long. Uh, just long enough to get the solder to flow into the wick and it really lessens your chance of lifting or damaging a pad or a trace. And you want to get the you want to get the right type of wick that has the flux in it, because if you get the wick without the flux, you'll have to add your own flux. Otherwise, you'll be holding it on there forever, and you'll never get the solder to flow into the wick. It needs the it needs the the braid that you're using or the the wick that you're using needs flux in it in order for the solder to flow into the braid. So this is what I use. It's Chemtronics, and it's seven two I'm sorry seven seven zero four two four four eight eight eight. So get yourself some of this, comes in the roll here, and I highly recommend this because this has the, the flux in it, and all you have to do is just kind of gently tab, uh, tap it or ta dab it on the pad, and the solder flows right into it, and you don't have to run the risk of, or it really lessens the risk of damaging the pad or the trace. So I still need to go through and clean it up, you know, just use uh, some alcohol and a brush and you'd clean up all the flux. We'll do that later. but. I wanted to put this on there and I realized I can't do that until I re-solder on the dag wire onto the neck and I got the disconnector reflowed like I mentioned as well. So uh, there is a discrepancy. Uh, the cap kit comes with a 250 volt 100 microfarad for location C313, but this one actually had a 160 volt 47 microfarad. So the cap kit calls out for you to put in a 100 microfarad in this spot, but originally this came with a 47 microfarad in there. So I put a 47 in there because that's what came out. Now you can put a 100 in there and it'll likely be just fine, but this had a 47 in there from the factory, so I'm gonna put a 47 back in. And the only cap that actually showed any signs of leakage was this cap over here, C506. There was a little bit of leakage around there. And then on the cap itself, you can see a little bit of leakage on the cap. Everything else, all the other caps didn't show any signs of leakage at all, but I'm sure they're probably dried out after 40 years. So. Yeah, it's now ready to hook back up to the tube and I need to re-solder the dag wire on there and I'll cut away, come back, I'll have it fully back on the tube, ready, ready to test and we'll see if uh, our situation has improved. So let's find out. Okay, everything is hooked back up, ready to go. We got anode, neck, yoke, ground, power, video, remote. Uh, I say remote, there's no remote board, all the pots are on the chassis, but we always count to seven. So. Yeah, ready to go. Let's uh, get the camera on the tripod here and let's see if our situation has improved. Here we go. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, yeah, I got the dag ground hooked back up and soldered back on and all that. So, okay, uh, one, two, three. Okay, came on, nothing exploded. I verified all the caps are in the right orientation. And our situation has not improved. Look at that. Wow. So, is that a filter cap? Or is that something different? This got much more interesting. Hmm. I wonder what our B-plus is reading. Let's look at the B-plus while this is happening here. Uh, it's going to be difficult to do. Fish in here and... Yeah, I'm going to have to get a... We'll do that later because I don't think it's a B-plus issue. I have to use a lead to get in there and look at it. So, oh, that's even worse. Look at that. Wow. Um, let's try and adjust horizontal hold here. I don't think it's a hold issue, though. Uh, that... Uh, well, no, it's, it's 
it's sinking, but let's try something different here. Hmm, vertical hold seems to affect it as well. Okay, it's not a flyback issue. Hmm. This almost seems like a this almost seems like a resistor out of spec or possibly an issue with the oscillation IC. Oh um, our flyback is high pitched noising on me. That's common on these. Huh. Well, let's take this our vertical size is too high. Let's adjust our vertical size down a bit. That's better. Shut up, flyback. Huh. Focus is a bit out. Right there is good. Well, um, is that a... An, uh, shut up! Shut up! Is that an oscillation problem or... Yeah. Let's uh, tear back into it, see what we can figure out. Okay, real quick here, I just wanted to show you the B+. Plus. I got it attached to that leg, the regulated side of the resistor down there, and it's 129.3, so B+, plus is perfectly fine. Not a B+, plus problem. So, let's see if we can dive back into this. Maybe change out the filter cap and see if that filter cap is the issue. Okay, so I changed the filter cap, thinking the filter cap might have been the problem of our, you know, wonky image. Uh, and it turns out that I, it's a good thing I did, because you can see here that it's got leaky electrolyte all around the perimeter of it. And if we look down here at the capacitor, you can see around there where it's got all the electrolyte remnants around there. So this was leaking and it did need to be replaced. So I'm glad I did that, but that was not the, the solution to our problem. It turns out that there's no problem at all. <laughs> the uh, Mortal Kombat board that I normally use for testing on these systems and setups the reason it's a test board is because it doesn't like to play nice with some monitors. Like, it'll sync with the 7000, and it'll sync with, I believe, the uh, K4600 and the G07, but something like the K7400, the U2000, and the K4900, it doesn't quite like those sync signals, and it goes haywire. So it turns out that our, our haywire image is not a problem of the monitor or the chassis or anything. It's a problem with the board. Uh, so all that, well, I didn't, it's not, it's not wasted effort because this needed to be refloated and rebuilt and capped and all that anyway. So this needed that, but the, the wonky image that we saw at the beginning is not caused by any of that. It was just simply my, the, the test board that I used was not uh, jiving well with this sync signal and oscillation circuit because that's why this board is a test board. So uh, I'll show you here. If we, I have done nothing else to this since I just saw you a moment ago with the wonky image. All I've done is change this out. It didn't fix the issue. So I, I thought, you know what, maybe let's try a different, a different video source. So I hooked up the test pattern generator, and if we turn this on... It's perfectly fine. So it's just, it was an issue with the MK board that I was using, not liking this oscillation circuit. And again, that's why it's a test board, because it's got that issue. That's why I haven't sold it or put it in a machine, because it's got that problem. And I, it's been so long since I've come across a monitor or worked on a monitor that I didn't like that I forgot about that. So yeah, nothing wrong with this at all. So after the rebuild, fully working, glorious, beautiful colors. And here you can see the screen burn on it. So... And whatever down the I don't know what game this came out. I think it came out of a Taito cabinet because it's got these lights here on the top, uh, bulb uh, bayonet holders they're called in a connector form. So I don't like a 10 yard fight or something. I don't know what this came out of, but yeah, uh, working and looking fantastic. So, and just to show it again, we'll turn this off. And I have a WWF WrestleFest uh, right here. And we're just going to real quick without turning the monitor off, hook up the WrestleFest board, and there you go. No wonkiness, looks and works great. So, yep, that's all it was, was my NK board acting up and not a problem with the chassis. So yeah, now that we have this all rebuilt and reflowed and refreshed and including a filter cap and cleaned up, uh, it's ready to last a number of more years here. So 
I'll let the owner of this know that he's got, uh, I believe, four out of seven now. I skipped over the K7000. I think I mentioned that previously because it didn't need any work that I haven't already showcased about 20 times. There, nothing was wrong with it of, of note, anything of note to make a video on. So out of the seven monitors he's dropped off, we are now four for four for four, I should say. So I'll let him know and I'll continue on with the other three. And if there's anything of note, uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, the last three that we need to work on are two Geo7s and a Sharp XM1801 out of a Nintendo Red Tent. And that one's got a horizontal position and audio issues, so that should... Uh, oh, and I think it has some partial vertical collapse as well. So that should be interesting, so stay tuned for that. Otherwise, yeah, I appreciate it. I just was using the wrong board, so or I had an issue with my MK board. <laughs> but, uh, still good information to put out there anyway, so like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate it. And I, at some point, I'm going to talk about the differences in the K4900. There's three different 4900 versions, three of them. There's a three-pot, a four-pot, and a five-pot. And all three of them have a specific yoke that's required. And if you use the, the three-pot on the four-pot yoke or the five-pot on the four-pot yoke and things like that, you're going to end up with, with screen tearing. Like for instance, if this is a three pot version, so if you see there, there are five pots, one, two, three, and then four, five. The four, five, which is the black level and the horizontal hold are on every K4900, but there, there's just three right there. Then there's one right there that's missing for vertical linearity. Uh, there is a version of the 4900 that has that pot installed, and then there's a version that has a uh, vertical position mod installed in place of the jumper. So this is the three pot, the ones that have the vertical linearity are known as the four pot, and the one that has the vertical position pot is known as the five pot. And they all use a different yoke. So hopefully at some point I'm going to try and acquire all three of the proper yokes and all three of the chassis and try and do a tutorial of all three of them and talk about the differences. Uh, but until then, you know, um, we'll have to do with just the individual uh, content like this. So again, thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned something, and I appreciate it, and we'll see you next time.